You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide, number 16. I'm Matt, and Bob is not with us today. No, he is not. That Bob is, is with his granddaughter. Yeah, that is the voice of Eric, the producer that you're hearing. Hello, hello. And um, uh, Tim Smith is joining us as well. Hello. Hello, Tim. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a surprise guest today. I don't know if I should let this linger a little longer or... Well, no, they've they've read the title already, so they know. It's uh, Jim Hessler from the Battle of Gettysburg podcast, as well as the wor- uh, world-renowned author, licensed guide. What else, Jim? Isn't author, licensed guide, and podcaster enough for that's, one man? I Isn't think that enough? enough? I think it's enough. This is a historic moment. Nobody said it could happen, <laughs> and here it is. It's happening. Uh, just to give you an idea, Jim's books are Gettysburg's Peach Orchard, Long Street Sickles, and the Bloody Fight for the Commanding Ground along the Emmitsburg Road uh, that he co-wrote with Britt Eisenberg, also a licensed guide. Sickles at Gettysburg, um, which he wrote solo. solo. And then Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg with Wayne Motts, also licensed guide, and was it president of the National Civil War Museum? Is that right? CEO, National Civil CEO. War Museum in Harrisburg. In Harrisburg. Okay, there we go. Well, we are sitting in the Peach Orchard today. Um, we were originally going to do it at the Sherfy Farm, but then we thought, well, maybe we'll get in trouble for being there. We weren't really sure. So we said, well, let's go over to the Peach Orchard anyway, and here we are. We're out of the sun. Everything's a lot better. Jim, um, do us a favor. Uh, give the listeners uh, just a, a background. Why is the Peach Orchard so significant? Why are we even out here? Lead us up to the Peach Orchard with the sure, background. Sure, you know. First of all, I want to thank you guys for uh, having me on the program. You know, I feel bad for the listeners. You've been advertising me as kind of a special surprise. That's they right. were probably all thinking, "Oh, it's Gary! It's Gary!" <laughs> no, it's Jim no, and Tim it's Jim, instead it's of Jim and Tim instead of instead of. We'll Tim get and Gary, Gary someday. Yeah, that's Jim. Maybe. Jim is fine. We're good. We're good. So, <laughs> okay. So, anyways, what was the question? Oh yeah, I bring him up to speed on the Peach oh, Orchard. Oh yes, up to speed. Give us a background. Sure. So, um, well, one of the reasons why you know I've devoted some writing to the Peach Orchard uh, and try to focus on it on my battlefield tours. I've always felt like it's arguably the most underrated spot on the battlefield. I mean, certainly when you talk about the second day at Gettysburg, it certainly unintentionally drives George Meade's defense, but it also drives a lot of the tactics, movements, and strategy of Lee, Longstreet, and the uh, Confederate Army. Um, you know, as I'm sure most of our listeners know, there was not su- there was not supposed to be anybody defending the Peach Orchard, but a uh, colorful and controversial uh, former attorney, congressman turned general by the name of Dan Sickles moved forward from Cemetery Ridge during the early afternoon of July 2nd. Sickles moved forward from Cemetery Ridge to occupy a position here along the Peach Orchard, which runs in front of the Union Fish Hook and is kind of along the Emmitsburg Road. Now Sickles, a charming, roguish, colorful character. Right, Tim? Right, Tim? Sickles. There you go. <laughs> our first Sickles of the night, but hopefully not our last. Sickles had a lot of reasons for wanting to move forward. I imagine we'll get into those as the, uh, sure. as the, uh, as the evening continues. But his movement towards into the Peach Orchard and towards the Emmitsburg Road really forced General Meade to kind of patch together and modify the defense of his left flank during the fighting on July 2nd. Got a quick question there on that. Uh, So does he go forward with Meade's permission? Did he consult with Meade at all, or is he just out of the blue going? So Sickles had orders, clearly Sickles received orders from General Meade to remain on Cemetery Ridge. And again, I imagine we'll probably get into the weeds on that as Mm -hmm. the evening goes on. But Sickles either did not miss... Sickles either did not understand Meade's orders, he was confused, or he simply liked the position out here better. So Sickles did make an attempt or two to try to clarify the situation with General Meade, uh, but ultimately did move forward without orders and more or less on his own hook. You know, General Meade, General Meade didn't find out that Sickles was out here until, you know, after three o'clock or so in the afternoon on July 2nd when the, the ball was pretty much ready to open. 
Okay, so they, they come out here. Um, I, I interrupted you in your flow there. No, you're so good. Go ahead. Well, uh, Want to finish it up? And Sure. So, I mean, okay. Sickles, Sickles and his third core are out here. Um, they, they occupy an awkward position here along the Emmitsburg Road. They're in what's called a salient, which means they're kind of facing in two directions. He's got his flanks in the air. He's too far in front of Meade's interior lines. All bad, bad stuff for the Union defense. But when Longstreet when James Longstreet was ready to begin the Confederate attack at about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the Union left flank was not in a position or location that Longstreet expected it to be in. So when Longstreet's attack began, Longstreet and his subordinate officers had to modify their movements to adjust to this new left flank. What's the moral of the story? It's a cluster on both sides. It messes up Longstreet's attack. It messes up Meade's defense. And I think that's something that probably probably most Gettysburg historians can agree on. All right. So... Um there's, I guess, uh, would you call? Would it be fair to say there's several phases of this uh, fight out here? It doesn't all happen at once. In other words, it's kind of like uh, waves rolling up on a shore or something, right? The Confederate at- uh, attack. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely multi-phased. You know, it probably starts about three o'clock ish or so with a fairly heavy Confederate artillery bombardment. Um, as Longstreet's artillery under Edward Porter Alexander is in position along what we call today, you know, Warfield Ridge, mm-hmm. directly opposite us. Um, so there's a very heavy artillery engagement between the Confederates and the Yankee artillery that that runs in the early stages of the afternoon. Uh, Union infantry here then will participate in helping to repulse General Kershaw's first Confederate attack on the wheat field. And then probably the third phase would begin about 6 or 6.30 or so in the uh, early evening when William Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade steps off of Warfield Ridge and more or less comes crashing right into the peach orchard. And that's pretty much when the gloves come off. All right. So uh, Ken Dahl is going to start us off with a question. Question, and it's regarding the Sherfy Farm and Barksdale, et cetera, et cetera. He says, don't know if this one is appropriate, but I was That's just... always a great way to start, right? Yeah, really. I was just curious about the location of Watson's Battery. I have read that Humphreys and the 21st Mississippi overran Watson's Battery. What was that battery, uh, or was that battery located where its marker is? I have read the position might be south of the marker. If so... Why the confusion as to the location? Okay, so a multi-part. Not mm. sure if it's appropriate. Most, question. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thanks, Ken, for the uh, for the question. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would kind of start by saying the the general battery movements of Malbone, Peggy, Watson are kind of a hot mess here at Gettysburg. Uh, you know, Watson doesn't leave any sort of clear report or anything like that that we can kind of base his movements off of. And frankly, some of the other Union high command descriptions are kind of confusing and conflicting. So so short answer is we don't really have great clarity on where Watson is. Um, but what happens is later in the afternoon, after the peach orchard has started to fall apart and crumble uh, under the onslaught of Confederate attacks, Watson's battery is among an artillery line that is pushed back beyond the Trossel Farm and towards Cemetery Ridge uh, under the command of Freeman McGilvery. We sometimes refer to it as the Plum Run Artillery Line. Watson was on the left of this patchwork artillery line that McGilvery was putting together. Now, the monument, the marker that's on the battlefield today is kind of on the north side of modern-day United States Avenue. And if that were the Trussell Farm Lane route at the time of the battle, that would quite possibly approximate Watson's position. But correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, we don't really think modern United States Avenue beyond the Trussell Farm actually yeah, th- is that, the correct that's route. The, that's the issue with uh, the last part of his question about the placement of the monument is that uh, United States Avenue from the Trossel Farm over to Hancock, uh, you know, Sedgwick Avenue, whichever you want to call it at that point near the Wykert Farm, that the Trossel Farm Lane was uh, to the south of that. And that the Trossel Farm Lane ran into the woods and then a uh, path went up through the woods and went over to the Wykert Farm. And when... Um, uh, I, I I think it when they there's a there's a whole file about this 
at the National Archives. But uh, when they went in to put up the government marker, because it's a United States regular artillery unit, Malbone Watson, uh, they wanted to position it north of the Trosel Farm Lane, but in the interim, United States Avenue had been put in, and they put it north in the United States Avenue, not realizing that that did not approximate the lane, and so the monument's believed to be. So they like, kind of you know, they kind of moved the lane on us is the problem. Yeah, and okay. so yeah. And so today, when you go past the Trussell Farm, there's that there's that horse path I was slash ask biking you, is that path. Where it yeah. was that and you're you know, about? it's only been like um, ten years that that horse trail was placed at that location they put that bridge across plum run and they put the horse trail there so now today there's a horse trail on approximating where we believe the trosso farm lane was this is more difficult hmm. 20 years ago when yeah. eric campbell was studying it. and eric campbell one of our park rangers gave interpretive tours and he would he's the one who said hey you know this is definitely in the wrong place he is probably farther out here and of course it makes more sense that it was south of the current united states avenue on a little rise of ground where malbone watson's battery is because of course the 21st mississippi got all the way into that area and if they made it all the way up to the area where the you know the um u.s regular artillery monument for the unit is that's a pretty good distance yeah and don't get me wrong the 21st mississippi was a mighty unit but you know even that would be that would be quite so so i guess if it were to be moved to its quote unquote and i'm making air quotes right. correct location probably would be moved about 250 ish yards to the south of where the uh, where the current marker okay. is okay all right, cool. Um, okay, let's see here. We've got uh, Dennis, uh, no, sorry, Stephen Byers. Stephen Byers says, I have read accounts of soldiers who saw the remnants of the burned out Sherfy barn with their ghastly detail. Um, do we have any accounts from Joseph Sherfy or others about cleaning it up? Did he receive compensation from the U.S. government for the loss of this barn? That's a good question. So what, what are the, like some of the... Sherfy and anybody else on the battlefield who went back to their property after the battle, what what kind of horror stories did they report? But go ahead with Sherfy. Well, you know, if I could first, yeah, I want to thank, uh, was it Stephen for the Steven, question? Yeah. yeah, thanks, Stephen, for the question, because when Britt and I did the Gettysburg's Peach Orchard book, one of the things we wanted to make sure we called out was the story of the Sherfys, mm -hmm. you know, before, during, and 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 after the battle. So that was something that we really wanted to call out. And for whatever reason, the burning of the Sherfy barn has always been a story that's um, um, interested me personally. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, the Sherfy barn was set on fire by an errant artillery shell, we believe on the morning of July 3rd, uh, 1863. And there's numerous accounts, mostly Confederate accounts, which would make sense since it was behind Confederate lines, uh, that talked to the burning of the Sherfy barn. Now, members of the 114th Pennsylvania Zouaves, who had their very distinctive Zouave, you know, blue and red uniform, had crawled in there to take cover after fighting around the Peach Orchard on July 2nd. And the story has always been was that many of these wounded Zouaves could not get out when the barn was got set, was set on fire and, you know, unfortunately were burned alive. Hmm. Uh, and many Confederate accounts, many veteran accounts talk about that this was one of the grisliest sights that they had ever seen. Probably many people don't realize the 20th Maine bivouacked on the Sherfy property after the battle. And I mean, we have accounts from Ellis Spear and no less than Joshua Chamberlain oh. talking about looking into the smoldering ruins of the Sherfy barn and, and literally seeing, you know, what they call roasted heads and uh. bodies that in some cases were still alive after a couple days. If I could share a dramatic reading from Chamberlain. By all means. Uh, he says, quote, There lay the remnants too terrible to describe of officers and men, rebel and union, half burned or with roasted heads. Uh -huh. I hold back rather than attempt to describe the scene. And I always tell people, how horrible could it have been to leave Joshua Chamberlain speechless? <laughs> Good point. And you know, uh, it's interesting, the story uh, uh, Jim was talking about, um, if you read about it, even John Batchelder in his 1873 book, Gettysburg, What to See and How to See It, talks about the barn and the burning of the barn. And the Union accounts, um, uh, well, they try, uh, the accounts try to 
uh, suggest that no one was burned alive. Like the 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 the, the, the Confederates are very conscious of this that have written about it afterwards. Like, no, no, no. We took we dragged all the live soldiers out, and the ones that were burned in the fire were wounded that had been brought into the barn that died of their wounds in the barn that night, and they were the ones that got roasted the bodies, and they were already dead previously. I Methinks you protest too much. <laughs> I think uh, that when you read these accounts, uh, you know, how did, did they check everybody to make sure that everybody right. you know, was you alive and Don't breathing? It's, it's and Victorian sensibility. You know, right. And I think they're... Uh, I think it's quite possible that live wounded were burned in the fire. I mean, have you ever noticed, uh, Jim, in the National Cemetery, there in the Pennsylvania section, there's a row of uh, graves and it says, unknown yeah. Zouav, yeah. unknown Zouav, unknown Zouav, all together. And it's always been my contention that that's probably the guys burned in the fire. I agree. Mm. I, I think mm. you're right. I think. Now, we didn't address the part of the question, though, did the Sherfies oh. talk about this? Right. Um, uh, the Sherfies do, um, of course, they're the ones who uh, have to, um, I think they're in a, one of the Sherfies civilian accounts, they actually talk about finding uh, dead bodies in the rubble of the barn when they uh, try to get the stuff out of the, the barn. I wanted to, you can talk about that, but I want to answer the, la- the yeah. other part of his question is that all the farmers in the area applied to the federal government for damages. And there seems to be some confusion about this generally in books on the Battle of Gettysburg. You find that the civilians are awarded damages. The state of Pennsylvania awarded damages to the civilians. But that doesn't mean they ever received, received it, yeah. the money. And I think uh, the sheriffies, I'd have to look, but it's like $2,500 or something a day. You have uh, a good memory, $2,466. <laughs> wow, pretty now, good. The sheriffies rebuilt their barn on the same foundation. And then I think it was in 1865, the, bur- the barn burned again. July 4th, 1866. Oh, what was the cause of that? Well, so the Sherfy family, I think, wakes up one night to find the barn just in flames. Oh, really? And they run out. They, you know, obviously they're going to try to save any livestock or anything they can in there. It was speculated in the local press that chicken thieves might have kicked over a lantern accidentally, okay. but, but they, but they, they don't really know. know. Now, I should mention, having said, we said all that about the Sheriffies. Right. Um, I don't know if this will come up in the later questions, but the Sheriffies are one of the few families that actually seem to have profited from the battle. As where other families are destitute, right away, uh, Sheriffy uh, is selling peaches from the famous peach orchard. Oh, yeah. And he cans, and we say cans, puts them in mason jars. Even before the battle, he was canning peaches. Right. And he, what was ever left of his 1863 stock, he canned them in the mason jars. Park and then Service he was has one of those. Them. In the collection, they have the Park Service yeah, has one of those. He was selling them, and it just seemed like even in the up into the 1880s, he always seemed to have another jar <laughs> of 1863 <laughs> peaches. And as a matter of fact, John Batchelder in 1873, uh, in his again in his tour book, Gettysburg: What to See and How to See It, actually uh, kind of um, throws some um, shame on Sheriffy, saying that. The peach orchard of today, 10 years later, is expanded like three times larger than it was at the time of the battle. And, you know, insinuating that he's so successful in his selling peaches that he expanded the size of it in his peach operations. Yeah. But, you know, well, but, that, you, but if I could, you yeah. know, we, and Tim's absolutely right, and we comment on that sort of mentality in our in our peach orchard book, and we sort of look at that the other way. You know, the Sherfies get no assistance from their government. You know, they're they're more or less cleaned out after the battle. And think how entrepreneurial Reverend Sherfie right. is to get that farm up and running and, 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 you know, and as prosperous as all Ultimately, it, it came out to be. Let's talk about the property, though, while we're here on the subject of the Sherfies. So if you're at the Peach Orchard, uh, a little bit north across the road is a, farm, a barn and a farmhouse. That's the Sherfie farm. But their property was how big? How big did it go? 40 acres? I think I had 50. So about 40, 50 acres. So 40 time 50 acres. So. All right. And, and so the Peach Orchard that we're in is... The peach orchard, the Sherfie's peach orchard, S- right? Yeah, sort of. Okay, S- 
the, go ahead. So there, there were two orchards. There were two orchards. You know, what we're sitting in today and, you know, what is generally marked in the park as the peach orchard uh, was what we call a four-acre lot. What, what we refer to as kind of the mature lot. These were the older trees. Okay. The bigger trees. But across from the Wheatfield Road running to opposite the Sherfy House and past the Wentz property was another six acres. Okay. And if my memory serves, Tim, I think that one had only been planted the year before. So it was younger. It was less mature. But again, one of the things Britt and I touch on in our book is we would argue that the, the heaviest fighting in, quote unquote, the peach orchard was actually in that one and not in what the park marks today as the peach orchard. Okay. That's so, so across the road, the peach orchard extended. And now also across the road, there's a foundation there now, but the house itself is gone. It's the Wentz house. Let's talk about that. Was that a, a tenant or was that a separate property? It's a separate property. Separate property. So John Wentz. So Sherfy's property kind of surrounded that's Wentz's correct. property. Okay. Let me uh, just get back to Sherfy for a second. Yeah. The one thing that's kind of interesting, uh, Jim, I like uh, or always thought interesting about Sherfy, is Sherfy was born and raised over here a short distance away. The, what we refer to as the Rose Farm today was actually the original Sherfy farm. And originally their name is Sherfig. And it's to change spelling a bunch of times. But, you know, uh, generally the Sherfies that there's a lot of Sherfies around today, they refer to it as Sherfie. But uh, Joseph Sherfie grew up in what we refer to as a rose farm, which today, of course, is a stone farmhouse. It replaced a log structure that was there probably in the 1790s. And um, uh, jo- uh, Jacob. Uh, Sheriffy had like 300 acres of land and the peach orchard that we're sitting in here and the the one at you know the park refers to as a famous peach orchard was originally part of that property but in 1842 Joseph Sheriffy the son purchased that um, acre uh, uh, 40 or 50 acres of land we're talking about just north and a little west of here well just north of here and that was actually a property um, and that there was a house on that that he tore down and then rebuilt the uh, brick house we see today. So the brick house today was built by Joseph Sherfy. Huh, and we should mention, yes, uh, you mentioned he's a reverend. He's a reverend of the German Baptist Brethren Church, uh, which uh, the church set on, um, uh, what is that, uh, Black Horse Tavern Road near Knoxland Road. Uh, uh, in the, there's a stone church there today. Uh, that it's still there. I guess part of it's the Civil War Church, and he okay. was a deacon of that church. And and to give you an idea, that's very very similar to the Dunkers at, oh, okay. uh, Antietam, at Antietam. The same yeah. the same kind same of type of yeah group. sect or whatever you call yeah. that. Yeah. All right. Anything else on the property before we move on? No, I think we uh, right. we covered it. And again, appreciate the uh, Sherfy. Oh, questions. you know, let me mention that he has uh, six children, three daughters, and three sons. And his wife is Mary Hagen, and uh, Sheriffy's mother-in-law was living with them at the time also, and she had just sold her house, and she actually lived on the Baltimore Pike near um, Granite Schoolhouse Road, or across from where Mulligan McDuffer uh, okay. was yeah. at the time. And I don't know a lot of people realize that, that the Hagen house over there, and um, that's the mother-in-law that was here at the time. So... Uh, on July 1st, there's Joseph Sherfy, his wife, his mother-in-law, and his six children are in, all in the house. Where did They're all in the house on July 1st, yes. but by the time the battle starts raging around their property, are they still here, or where did they go to? Everyone had fled by that time. Go ahead. Yeah, no, the kids, the kids flee, and Joseph, Mary, and the mother-in-law stay through the morning of July 2nd. Okay. Now, remember, by the morning of July 2nd, and this is even pre-Sickles move forward, you know, you've got third Corps skirmishers along the Emmitsburg Road, and there's skirmish fire going back and forth and at some point in early to mid morning the mother-in-law mrs hegan uh stops a bullet in the folds of her dress and at that point the officers and the soldiers kind of say okay get out so so the fan so the remaining the parents and the mother-in-law leave and um you know during the heavy fighting here on july 2nd then the house is obviously unoccupied so there were some uh soldiers who were able to say to them get out but not to jenny wade good good (laughs) there are no no cookies well let me mention since since uh jim brought it up that the bullet goes through uh uh the mother-in-law's dress as apparently they're starting to flee, and this is from the action over there 
um, on Confederate Avenue with uh, Wilcox and the Berdan Sharpshoes in the third main. The bullet goes through her dress, hits a fence post, hit, drops on the ground. She reaches down, picks it up, puts it in her pocket. Oh, really? She gives it to her granddaughter, and in the 1940s, her grandmom, or I guess actually uh, in the 1970s, the family ended up giving it to us. Oh, it's cool. Adams County Historical Society. So right, oh, off, awesome. right off the bat, the locals are picking stuff off yeah. the battlefield. Yeah. Right off the bat. And they weren't getting fined for it either. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dennis Cox ask, asks, who told Humphreys to take the 21st Mississippi down to the Trostle Farm instead of up the Emmitsburg Road? Also, do we know exactly where Barksdale was when he was shot off his horse? Okay, so this is our uh, second reference, I think, to the 21st Mississippi. Might might call for a little uh, splaining here. Well, actually, uh, can I uh, just one thing I wanted to clarify? Mm -hmm. You have Humphreys, 21st Mississippi, but so people don't get confused. There's also yeah, the division I was gonna commander. Come to that. Okay. I was going to come to that. Yeah, Sorry, you, I didn't mean to yeah, jump no, the gun. Okay. But. <laughs> so, so 21st Mississippi is one of the four regiments in William Barksdale's brigade that ultimately smashes into into the peach orchard. So yes, there are two Humphreys in and around the peach orchard. There is General Andrew Humphreys, who is a division commander in the Third Corps, but the 21st Mississippi is commanded by Colonel Benjamin Grubb, or as we like to call him, B.G. Humphreys. All right, so Colonel Humphreys was 54 years old uh, at the Battle of Gettysburg. He had kind of a, a unique distinction. His, his West Point career was notable because he was among 19 students who were expelled following the famous eggnog riot at the academy uh in christmas of 1826 so uh, you know how can you top the eggnog riot on your uh, on your resume but yada 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 one thing leads to another and he's commanding the 21st mississippi at the battle of gettysburg okay so anyways to get to the question who orders humphreys to ba colonel humphreys to basically go after Bigelow's battery and end up, you know, kind of detached from the rest of Barksdale's brigade. I think it's Colonel Humphreys. I think when Colonel Humphreys kind of smashes into the Union line here at the Peach Orchard, comes over kind of the crest of the ridge, and as he looks down, you know, kind of onto the plain east of the Peach Orchard, he sees a plain basically dotted with fleeing Yankees. And Colonel Humphreys himself basically said that I could see some federal lines moving to the rear hurriedly but in good order and some guns at the foot of the slope to my right firing rapidly on kershaw's lines so that would probably be a reference to bigelow's ninth massachusetts and according to colonel humphreys i immediately wheeled the 21st regiment away from barksdale's brigade and to the right because okay. come on what what self-respecting confederate mississippian is going to ignore you know fleeing infantry and an unattended battery <laughs> right it was, just, it was just too good to pass yeah. off. Okay. All right. That's pretty good. Anything to add to that, Tim? No. Excellent. All okay. right. Paula Belton, she has a two-part question. Well, no, you know oh, what? what? We, never got to, we never got to the second yeah. part of what his question. What was the second part of the question? Oh, shot. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And I would just say it depends. And uh, 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 Jim, I don't know what you wrote uh, exactly about this in your book. but You've read the book, right? Uh, yes. yes. When okay. it first came out, I did read the book. Excellent. So, um. Uh, but, you know, it depends on which count, which account you believe. But uh, I seem to think he was still on his horse when he caught a volley from the 11th New Jersey. So as Barksdale wheeled and the th uh, three regiments of his brigade headed northward along the Emmitsburg Road and hit Humphrey's division, uh, some of the units wheel and fire into him. And so, uh, uh, do you have an idea of when he might have been taken off his horse? You know, he's wounded. At s he's shot off his horse, p possibly wounded, and then, of course, at a different location later killed. So, it depends on what aspect we're, of his wounding we're talking about. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, I think you're, yeah, I think Tim's referring to, there's an account, I think, in the regimental of the, the 11th New Jersey, yes. where they talk about knocking down a fez-wearing rebel who they, they identified as Barksdale. Okay. The, um, the traditional where was Barksdale killed question is sort of, again, beyond the Trostle Farm. So, we kind of seem to be back down to that area of the field again. What we often refer to as sort of the Kadori Trostle Thicket. And, um, you know, there were a lot of accounts of what happened. An officer in the 100 in 26 New York said that Barksdale was ultimately brought down by a volley from either the 125th or the 126th New York. So somebody in 
in George Willard's brigade. I would I sometimes like to answer that question, where was Barksdale killed? By saying he was killed where Colonel George Willard was mortally wounded. Because everybody always forgets about poor Willard. Colonel Willard, yeah, yeah. Who, who is mortally wounded in the same action. And we do kind of have a marker, you know, noting where that happened. And right. Barksdale was roughly in the same area. How, how many wounds did Barksdale receive? Was it just one? I don't know if there's any uh, description of his wounds by any of the. Is there a Confederate surgeon that describes his wounds? There's a um, uh, the field surgeon who attends to him, and I don't have that account off the top of my head tonight. So, folks, you're going to have to buy the book uh, to get go. the answer to that one. But there, there were go. multiple wounds. But it was a Union surgeon, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Well, one yeah. thing we farm. One thing we do know is that Barksdale is wounded, and he's left in the Kadori thicket, and then late at night. Um, unit uh, northern soldiers learn of his being out there and they come out and get him and bring him back and he actually dies at the Hummelball farm and there's an account of him being buried when he dies in, next to the Hummelball farm. I read uh, an account that uh, before he was buried, as soon as he died, they started <laughs> taking souvenirs off his uniform and stuff. Yeah, there's, um, there, there's an account that we use in the book, which I thought was really kind of an appropriate, you know, we like to think of war as kind of a glorious thing and, and Gettysburg, you know, glory and honor and all that stuff. A guy who saw Barksdale's uh, body said, quote, he had fought without the wig, which had been once knocked off in the halls of representative. Remember Barksdale oh, in yeah, Congress yeah. once had his wig knocked off? <laughs> And his bald head and broad face with open, unblinking eyes lay uncovered in the sunshine. There he lay alone without a comrade to brush the flies from his corpse. And that was sort of the condition of Barksdale's body, as, as Tim said, as they buried him on the farm. Well, that's a great way to end that one. Uh, let's move on to Paula Belton. She has a two-part question. Uh, according to several sources, several Confederates captured at the Peach Orchard and around the Sherfy Farm... General Graham was wounded and captured, was held prisoner at the Sherfy Farm for a while. Uh, also, according to Tim Smith's book on page 23, Farms at Gettysburg. Oh. What do you mean, ugh? Uh, the 63rd PA reported Mrs. Sherfy had a wall with photos of men who fought on her property. That's good. Is, is, is the collection of photos somewhere that the public can see, or are they in a private collection? I love that question. Well, so of I'm course you I put that one <laughs> sentence in there hoping that someone would appreciate well, that Paula one did. sentence. You know, unfortunately, in that small book, there's no footnotes. There was no opportunity for me to, believe me, I would have footnotes if I was allowed <laughs> to have them at that time. <laughs> but, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a photographic book of some of the farms with the sources of photographs and then some additional information. But at the Adams County Historical Society, I already mentioned that we have the bullet from the Sherfy family. We have photographs from the Sherfy family, and we have some really cool letters from the Sherfy family. And we have a letter written to Mrs. Sherfy by a member of the 63rd Pennsylvania. And he says in the letter, I am sending you my photograph. Could you put the photograph on the wall where you have the photos of the other members of my company. And I'm thinking like, you know, we don't know any more about it. We don't know anything. I've never seen another mention of her having a wall of photographs. But I'm thinking, does she have like the 114th Regiment's photographs from this part of the wall and the 63rd are over here? No, that would be your wall. The 105th. And, oh, man. Is that true? And do, do these photographs ex Can you imagine right, something yeah. like this? So you, but you have some photographs at no. the- Oh, you we have, just no. have this letter oh. where this guy is writing to Mr. Sheriffy and he says he's including the photograph oh, with the but letter, but all we it. have is the letter. Oh, okay. You know, we uh, we do quote from that letter in our book, with the same letter in our book as well. And God bless the Adams County Historical Society. Can I just say that? Yeah, really. For their, yeah. For their healthy repository of, of historical documents. But, um, you know, that does tie into Mrs. Sherfy. Well, all of the Sherfys liked to entertain the veterans. And, you know, this is a good example of that. The veterans would come back. They wanted to see where they fought. The Sherfys would tell them stories. Uh, they would tell them stories. You know, both sides would, would sort of entertain each other for an evening. And I think the the photo collection is is probably a good example of that how how would someone uh get to see what you have at the adams county historical society do they can they just walk up and knock yeah. on the door well you know obviously at the moment we're, well, we're uh, still close to the public but when we're open we have hours which are on our website and yeah people come into the historical society and 
Um, they ask to see information on the battle, and we provide it. Um, one thing, uh, so they need know, to have specific things in mind. Sometimes they don't know what we have. Okay. Sometimes you have to ask the right question of the staff at the right moment. Right. Okay. To see the cool stuff we have. Sometimes I'll know that somebody's working on a project, and I will um, go out of my way to make sure they put something in their book. Like when Jim. Uh, was working on his Pickett's Charge book, which I should say is one of my favorite books Thank you. on the Thank battle. You. Um, I really wanted him to have this one really cool letter we had by a veteran of the Washington Artillery who told, who mentioned exactly how many yards from the Emmitsburg Road the cannon was that fired the first shot during the bombardment. The gra- you're right, and thank you for that. And, and 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 the great thing about that particular account is, is it's like, well, it's like 65 yards from this marker, or 120 yards from this marker, or 300 from that one. And, you know, I've sat there on Google Earth trying to triangulate that, and uh, but but that's uh, part of the fun of being the historian, right? <laughs> yeah. So I know so, I said... But, but oh, yeah. we should say that not everybody gets, you know, special treatment when they come to this historical sure. site. You have to ask the right question. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. So know what you want to see before you go in there. Um, so dare I say we forgot the second part of that question again? Yeah. No, I, I'm just... Maybe I missed... I went over it. Go ahead. What, uh, it was what part, was the, the part, part about Graham being captured. Oh, Graham. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. And so again, the the capture of Brigadier General Charles Graham, uh, one of the Union generals at the, uh, at the Peach Orchard is a great story because he ultimately will become the high ranking Union officer still in captivity after the Battle of Gettysburg. And, you know, he's kind of a guy people never talk about. Uh, but the question specifically was, was he held at the Sherfee farm, I think? Um, you know, we know there's a couple of accounts of how he was captured. He had been wounded. He was trying to rally the men. And a uh, Mississippi volley brought down him and his horse. And, um, you know, as the Mississippians kind of swept over him, he was he was scooped up and, and taken behind the lines. I don't know of any specific account that says, I stopped at the Sherfee farm to get rounded up. But we do have an account or two indicating Confederates were probably sort of corralling Union prisoners, at least around the property, before they were they were taken taken further behind the lines. And I guess in fairness to Paula, I should say she did parenthetically put in here, eventually we know he goes to Richmond and is traded. Right. Okay. All right, good. A All trivia right. question? Do we know who he's traded for? I was thinking, um, um, I, I remember it's one of those things where uh, there's early Gettysburg books and they tell you who he's traded for, but it was incorrect. And so uh, then I learned later that I rem- if I remember correctly, they used to say he was traded for Samuel Tilden. Oh, did they used to say that? You know, that might have been before my time. Yeah. And then, and then um, uh, who was he traded for? Brigadier General James Kemper, who was uh-huh. wounded in Pickett's Charge. Did you say that, Eric? Excellent. No, I I held my tongue until the experts were done uh, speaking. Well, you should have said it. You would have impressed us. And you know, uh, the, well. you know the two you know, the two of them. Kemper Kemper's wound was far more severe. And when Kemper was exchanged, he joked, "quote that the Confederacy was being swindled by giving a sound man in exchange for an utterly useless one." <laughs> <laughs> he had a way uh, with words. Yeah, he did. Think outside the bus and let Getty's Bike Tours show you the only way to truly experience Gettysburg. There's a reason why Getty's Bike Tours is the longest running bicycle tour company in Gettysburg, and that's because they put the customer's experience at the top of their list of priorities. Follow a licensed battlefield guide through some of the most legendary ground in American history. There's a tour route for everyone, from the newbie to the hardcore history buff. So go to Gettysbike.com or call 717-752-7752 and book your reservation today. Mention addressing Gettysburg and receive 10% off your tour. That's Gettysbike.com or 717-752-7752. Discount does not apply to rentals. Life Lessons from American History. Here's one you can use today for personal growth. Gettysburg Lessons with one of three valuable lessons from Charles Knapp. Do what you ought to do. Life is a creative tension between what's in it for me and what you ought to do. Between what you know and what you ought to know. Between what you think and what you ought to think. Between what you accept and what you ought to fight for. Freedom beckons you to do what you want to do, but responsibility tells you what you ought to do. Success is the union of the freedom to exercise your talents and the responsibility 
to use those talents wisely. Doing what you ought to do is the ideal influence. It is leadership in motion. To get the full classroom course of Gettysburg Lessons, go to gettysburglessons.com slash schools. Ah, uh, my favorite place to go. Mason Dixon Distillery. They create their award-winning spirits from grain grown on Gettysburg National Military Park. And they cook their comfort food from ingredients sourced from local farms. For great food, amazing drinks, engaging conversation, and plenty of on-site parking, which is really hard to find here in Gettysburg, head over to Mason Dixon Distillery located at 331 East Water Street. Mention you heard this ad on addressing Gettysburg and get half off any dessert with purchase of a meal. That's right, half off any dessert with the purchase of a meal just because you mentioned this show. That's Mason Dixon Distillery, 331 East Water Street, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Victorian Photography Studio, located on Steinware Avenue in historic downtown Gettysburg, is a vintage tintype and digital portrait studio. With hundreds of dresses and uniforms, as well as period correct props and backgrounds, VPS can help you capture the perfect moment in time. As one of the few remaining practitioners of the craft, the photographers at VPS are trained in the history and artistry of wet plate collodion photography. So stop on in or book online for a truly unique Gettysburg experience. Go to VictorianPhotographyStudio.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram at VPS underscore Gettysburg. That's VictorianPhotographyStudio.com and at VPS underscore Gettysburg on social media. Dog tags in the Civil War, one of the most devastating Union defeats took place in Florida, Confederate Lancers in New Mexico, a camel as a regimental mascot. Learn this and more on the Untold Civil War podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, and Buzzsprout website. All right, uh, Brian Derenick uh, can't sleep until he has the answer to this question. He says, can you speak to the damage and loss sustained by the Sherfy family as a result of the battle and unwillingness or inability of the U.S. government? Okay, so we kind of touched on this before, but I think he wants to get a little more specifically into the troubles that they had to go through to get that compensation. Tim, you mentioned that they were awarded well, I, it, but they didn't just say get it. I like this. None of the civilians receive comp. It's not them. It's, it's everybody. It's the whole area. And, um, you know, none well, of the civilians were compensated. Tell us what the process would have been like to well, do that. Well, you know, you could, There were. it's a long, complicated process. Try to simplify it. You could, right after the battle, uh, apply to the quartermaster general for damages. But you would, they're only going to pay if it's items that were taken and the items that you can prove were used by the federal army. They, they, they never pay for damages done to your property because mm. of the battle. Okay. So a lot of farmers south of Gettysburg got some money from the uh, uh, quartermaster because their firewood was used to cook uh, for the wounded. Okay. Or wounded were held in our house and you're being paid because your house is a hospital. But, you know... Um, we have examples where uh, someone comes in, takes a whole bunch of hay from a barn, but then, you know, there's the battle and the hay is not used. And so even they have a receipt for it, it wasn't used by the federal government, so they don't pay. And then, you know, they don't pay for damages, and they're not going to pay for anything the Confederates took or the Confederates did. So at first, uh, the locals get together, and they all f- file um, claims forms that were generated for that purpose and they ish- they send them to the federal government and the federal government isn't going to pay. So then they say, hey, you can reimburse with your state government. So then they send them there. But then uh, uh, the state government never pays. One unfortunate issue for the local people here is they are a Democratic county and voted for the Democratic Party and the Republicans are in control of Pennsylvania and the Republican legislators keep voting against compensation for the border counties and they keep in the articles in the newspaper like, well, if you send Republican representatives to, uh, you know, the state, maybe we'll, uh, you know, you know, Adhere to your we would help you, your, yeah. your help. Now, the total cost of the damages to Pennsylvania citizens in these claims is like $3 million. Mm, wow. And that's Adams County, Franklin County, Cumberland County, and a little bit of the other counties around where the invasion was. Uh, it cost $3 million to arm and equip the Pennsylvania reserves. Mm. So the state could have done it, but the rest of the state would have helped to bore the cost of paying the claims. And so what ends up happening is eventually 
the state decides, you know, we're never going to pay these, and they send all the claims to the federal government, and the federal government goes through all the claims, and the ones that had Confederate damages are sent back to the state, and they kept ones that had something in them that they would pay, and then they nitpicked, and they paid for this or that. And what you end up with is farmers who have thousands of dollars worth of damage getting a check for $60. Mm. Or uh, Mrs. Uh, Leister, for instance, I forget how much he gets, like $17. It's a very complicated process. Here's what I like about it. There's a bunch of paperwork that got created, and we have a bunch of uh, civilian accounts about the farms and the damages done because of the process. Okay. So, okay. And it's fascinating to read the claims. But um, it's kind of sad that the locals don't receive any kind of compensation because of their damages. Yeah. You know, and in the, in the case of the Sherfies, this goes on for 20 years. And I know other people had similar experiences. But, I mean, in the case of the Sherfies, it goes on for 20 years. I mean, 20 years. It's a long you know, time. It's, it's formally denied in 1883. And so you think about that. You know, you're this family. You're filing affidavits. You're attesting to your loyalty. And, you know, the government kind of drags their, uh, their feet on it for 20 years. And, yeah, specifically in the case of the Sherfies, when they when they ultimately issued their decision, you know, as Tim kind of implied, they said the, the claim said, "quote The circumstances at the time made it impossible to tell which side did the most damage. The rebels were likely to have taken it all, and in my opinion, more so." And that was kind of how they issued their how they rationalized not giving these people any money. Okay. Um, all right. Randoke wants to know. We kind of touched on this before, but um, I've got some questions, but. Uh, he asks, when were the current trees planted, and would a Civil War soldier recognize the orchard today as being how it looked then? So I remember years ago, there was nothing here. They took all the trees out. Um, and so these trees are like relatively new. They're several you, years old. How would you old. say? Ten years ago? I've got them at um, 2008. Yeah, that sounds right. Because it was a friend of mine, um, a friend of mine, what they call the Peach Orchard Brigade, who helped raise the money who did it. He says it was 2008. And they were sick? Is that why they got rid of them all? You no, know, they just stopped really producing peaches. Peach trees, the peach trees that were here before that, that were taken down, were like 25 years old. And, you know, peach trees don't produce peaches until... They're like four or five years old. As, as I, and then, of course, here, I'm not a peach orchard expert. Right. Um, peach, you know, or peach agricultural expert. Yeah. expert. But, uh, uh, but the peach trees that were here before that had gotten too old. And so they, for healthy peach orchard reasons, they had to take the peach orchard and replant it. Yeah, I have a friend who, who knows what type of peaches were here during the Battle of Gettysburg, uh-huh. and she'll repeatedly tell me and i'll repeatedly forget forget you know and people say to me on tours well what kind of peaches were they they're peaches do we need do we (laughs) do we really need to know more than that yeah but again we know for a fact that the visitor center has a jar of peaches that's right i've seen it 1863 peach orchard and we could get in there and we could you know have a scientist determine exactly what type of peaches that would be great. That would be great if we could. Um, so, but so these actually do produce peaches. These aren't like inert just for no, decoration. Right now they are, yes. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, people ask that all the time, and I'm like, and I don't it, know. You know I've never... In here, since you know they're interested in the peaches, um, years ago, I always, I always found it interesting. Years ago, they would grow, have the peaches in the peach orchard, and it was just understood that all of a sudden one day, the park would just turn its back. And anybody who wanted to could come in and take the peaches out of the peach orchard. You'd bring buckets and you'd just take them. Really? Yeah. And then uh, years after that, um, uh, in more recent years, they had a, they, they set up a stand and they sold peaches out of the peach orchard and raised money for the, I think that was the Friends of the National Park. And oh. then uh, now I don't know what they do with them, but I do notice that now they disappear. Yeah. You know, they they put right before they pick them, they put signs, do not pick peaches in peach orchard, and they disappear. Yeah. And, and speaking of, were you here in the days of Stuckey's? I mean, that was before my time. Were you around I was going to ask I was about not, that. Uh, I was not. No, okay. Stuckey's torn down before. Why don't we, uh, before why don't we do that, though? Let's talk about some of the things that were yeah. built, uh, that were uh, up buildings and other things here along the Emmitsburg Road, well, especially you, the peach orchard setting area. setting up Jim for this. We'll let Jim talk about this in a second. But, you know, one of the reasons, you know, and- I don't know if there was another book written about the Peach Orchard and the Emmitsburg Road before Jim wrote about it and and Britt. And one of the reasons is because, you know, 
the development along this road and the lack of interpretation of this area. Um, and, you know, in the 40s and the 50s and 60s, this road was highly developed. Right. There were, there were um, four or five motels from just south of the area of the Eisenhower Farm to the town that have been removed. And, and right up from uh, the Sherfy House was, um, was that... Um, uh, the Lee Mead Inn yeah, so, and yeah. the Battlefield Hotel was over here. There were two major hotels, one just north of the Sheriffy Farm, one just south of the Sheriffy Farm, and there were a bunch of other motels down. And there were houses along yeah. the Emmitsburg Road. I remember Gary and I, there were three or four houses right on the Emmitsburg Road just south of the Peach Orchard. And we stopped one day, and it was this little old lady in her garden. And she found a bullet in her garden and gave it to Gary while we were there. He oh. loves that story. But, uh, but that, those I remember houses one are gone. Just recent, there yeah. was one recently this removed. This area yeah. has been renovated just in the last 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these hotels were torn down in the, in the 60s and 70s. So this area... Now it looks much like it did at the time of the battle, but in the interim, it had been massively developed, and a lot of that development has been removed and, and restored. And, you know, think about, too, how close we were to Eisenhower's farm. Right. So the 1950s, 1960s, you can put your motel literally within a stone throw of Ike's Place. You know, a good story about that is that Eisenhower was an early member of an organization called the Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Association, and he... Uh, was n not um, not an active member, but like a, a public figure that uh, was kind of a, a spokesperson for them and helped them raise money. And uh, one of the things that uh, they were doing is removing some of this commercialism from the Emmitsburg Road. And, of course, there was a Stuckey's at the Peach Orchard, which was a chain restaurant really big in the South in the 50s and 60s. And Mamie's favorite thing in the world was pecan pie at Stuckey's. <laughs> and she was angry. With Eisenhower when he took the Stuckey's sure, down. For trying to fight that, for trying to fight that. <laughs> but yeah. now, so you, you could actually Google Stuckey's Peach Orchard, Gettysburg, and see a picture. Oh, yeah. There's there was a Texaco with park, it, I think. Park archives. Have yeah. Fun. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned the Texaco because one of the things... One of the things we uh, we found when we were doing ours our book was uh, there's a newspaper account from a guy who visited here in 1971. He was probably like a forerunner of Tim Smith because you could just tell this guy was just outraged after his visit. <laughs> but, so, but so the guy the guy writes in the newspaper quote across the road from the peach orchard we have a Stuckey's. You know it is a Stuckey's because the Coca-Cola sign, which is adjacent to the Texaco sign, tells you so. So I think <laughs> that kind of sums it up. Do you know where Stuckey's and Texaco, things that you would often find together around the country? Like, would it be a... That I don't know. Okay. I said, I, I, don't, I don't remember any Stuckey's in my time, so I don't know if there was sort of like a, a package deal or something. All right. Uh, okay, this one, I like this one here. Uh, Michael Stump wants to know, what are your thoughts on the Sherfy Farm in relation to Captain Johnston? Johnson or Johnston? Stun. Stun. Johnston's morning reconnaissance on July 2nd. Yeah, he's way far south yeah, of this. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've got elements of Buford's Cavalry in around here that morning. You know, the 6th New York says they literally bivouacked in the orchard. You've got Caliph's Battery. You've got cavalry patrols on the Millerstown Road, and you've got skirmishers on the Emmitsburg Road. So, yeah, I think Johnston has got to make a wide detour to bypass all of this. So, you, so, you know, know, generally, if people believe Captain Johnston's or, you know, a reconnaissance actually took place and he actually is where he says he is. They have him uh, riding down and crossing over near where South Confederate Avenue is the Emmitsburg Road and going up over Bushman Hill and Big Round Top to Little Round Top. If you don't believe Captain Johnson, like me, uh, I he, maybe he crosses him there. <laughs> maybe he crosses like at you know, the Eisenhower Inn or something down there and is on some other hill somewhere else. Somewhere else, know. yeah. Well, that's, the trend, that's the trendy thing these days is to kind of put him on a hill kind of behind yeah. where the uh, the Eisenhower is. Honestly, right. yeah. we just don't know. Yeah. All we right. Should be, we should be brave enough to say that sometimes that we don't know. That's good. I like does that. Any, does anybody think that he really didn't Here's the thing all, about like, it. Here's maybe... the thing about it. When he's asked about it, and you know, in the, in the letters, I guess there's two letters that he writes to McClaws in the Library of Congress collection. Uh, the the copies of the letters I think are in the Douglas South Hall Freeman collection, if I remember. And um, uh, he says that he was on Little Round Top. So it's not like he he doesn't think he's mistaken. 
Yeah. But he must be. He's got to be. But uh, let me, um, you know, one thing, uh, that I, I don't know if this question will come up. Excuse me if it comes up, but uh, uh, I wanted to make, uh, I wanted to uh, say this because, you know, in Jim's presence, I don't know if I've said this enough or before, but, you know, one of the reasons that Sickles is all of a sudden surprised and overwhelmed by the Confederate attack at the Peach Orchard is because of the cavalry. Because they should be out there patrolling uh-huh. and they should give timely warning that this force is coming. But no! The removal of said they cavalry. They are tired and have to ride <laughs> off to <laughs> Westminster and Tony Town because of all the heavy casualties they took on July 1st. <laughs> Man, you hate See, the cavalry. I'm coming in, waiting for the sickles bashing, and he goes, he goes, he goes 180 in the other direction. If it's not sickles, oh, it's Buford's sicker. cavalry. You oh, know, yeah. we uh, lay into the please. cavalry pretty often here. Hates the cavalry. <laughs> uh, all right, Katie Von Dietem would like to know what was Meade's order to Sickles on the morning of July second about occupying the line to the left of the Second Corps. Uh, I have always assumed that uh, he was ordered to occupy Little Round Top specifically, but recently heard that the order was vague and similar to Lee's order to Yule about capturing Cemetery Hill. In fact, I was just watching your uh, lecture oh, yeah. up at the, uh, and you mentioned if practicable is used, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So, maybe. So you know, I, I I would hesitate to put a value judgment like vague on it. You know, I wasn't here. Um, what what we know is that they're verbal. Therefore, they are not written, and so you know, kind of, kind of open for interpretation. What I mean, the, the nuts and the bolts of the order are that Sickles is supposed to extend the left of the Second Corps, replace where the Twelfth Corps had been the night before, and according to Meade, and this is Meade's description in the Joint Committee in the Conduct of the War. So we don't know if this is how Meade said it on the battlefield, but in the Joint Committee, Meade said, "And occupy that range of hills if practicable to do so." And that's probably where Katie's getting kind of the kind of the uh, the Yule the thing Yule from. thing. So none of their staff officers have any recollections of their conversation. They didn't overhear their conversation. Meade and Sickles. Well, you know, Captain George Meade Jr. Captain Meade Jr. was one of the staff officers involved, and there's some correspondence uh, that he that he writes. I forget maybe he's going to Webb. I forget who he's writing to after the war, where he's kind of where Captain Ju- Captain Meade Jr. is kind of talking about this, like you know, I, you know, I didn't see that original order but i think he probably gave it the night before and 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 stuff like that so yeah ironically there's nobody there who kind of steps forward and says yes i was there and i heard the order and and this is what it was you know which ultimately is what kind of opens up to 156 years of the uh the so-called mead sickles controversy and we touched on this in the beginning um, but can you get it and elaborate a little bit more about um, Sickles' efforts to come out here? Why does why does he want to come out here, first of all? Who does he talk to? What's the answers that he's getting? Why does he do it anyway? Yeah, yeah, sure. So there, there's a series of exchanges. Um, sometime after 8 o'clock in the morning, General Meade sends Captain Meade down along Cemetery Ridge to see if Sickles is in position. At that point in time, Sickles basically tells Captain Meade, you know, I'm not really sure where the 12th Corps was. That's a piece of the order that I think often gets overlooked, you know, because people kind of go, oh my God, you know, what kind of idiot could not see Little Round Top? Well, Sickles doesn't say, I can't see the hill. What he says is, well, you know, if you're telling me to replace the 12th Corps, I'm not really sure where they were. Right. And that kind of sets up, you know, kind of a series of exchanges. Um, a about 11 a.m. or so, Sickles and some of his boys ride to headquarters. And at that time, Sickles says to Meade and some of the assorted staff officers, you know, look, I'm not really sure about where I'm supposed to go. Um, I think I got some better ideas for my artillery. General Meade, can you come out and see us? Meade declines. He says he can't. He's too busy. Can you bring out General Warren, the chief engineer? General Warren's too busy. Finally, they agree that General Hunt, the chief of artillery, can come out and kind of take a look. And so there's obviously a conversation around, you know, if I stay in that original position, I'm not sure how I'm going to post my guns. Can General Hunt help us help us do do that okay and it's after that 11 o'clock meeting sickles and hunt leave headquarters and whoa instead of going down cemetery ridge sickles takes <sighs> Hunt all the way out here and what die this is the first time i had any idea sickles <laughs> was thinking of such a maneuver and you know that's okay. kind of when all the uh, all the fun begins okay all right all right all right um 
All right, let's move on here to uh, Jason Hartman. And he has a close tie to this part of the battle. He asks, could you talk about the actions of the 141st Pennsylvania? My third great granduncle was in Company G and died in the battle. His name was Jonathan E. Elmer. Mm. Okay. I love the 141st. I think it's one of the unsung units of the battle you don't hear much about. And they suffered heavy casualties. And, of course, uh, Colonel Henry Murdell uh, from Tawanda. I think they're the Bradford County. Is that Bradford County Regiment? And so upstate uh, Pennsylvania. And um, they, they were here for quite a while. And I guess they're one of the units that gets overrun when the 21st Mississippi hits. Yeah, they, um, you know, the 141st is unique. Um, they've got a 71% casualty rate after they come out of the uh, Peach Orchard, which becomes the highest casualty rate in General Graham's Brigade and one of the highest of any Union regiment at, at Gaddy's. So, you know, I think I think they're a good example. I talked before that Britt and I really think the heaviest peach orchard fighting was actually north of the road, kind of near where the Wentz property is. And the 141st, I think, is a good example of that, because after they kind of get driven out of this peach orchard by the 21st Mississippi, they're among the units that reforms in and around the Wentz property. And I think just get hammered with a couple of ollies as they're trying to uh, trying to get off the field. So are they are they the, the regiment in this part of the fighting that's got the highest casualty rate? Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. OK. I don't know if you said that. I'm sorry if you did. <laughs> it didn't mean to make you repeat yourself. Um, OK. Morgan Draper has the last, uh, no, he doesn't have the last question. Here we go. Uh, he's got two questions, though. What is your opinion of Dan Sickles' action on the second day? People always seem to have very strong opinions one way or the other, and I'm curious what the guides think. Well, <laughs> here we go. I, I say when, you know, just being a guide, uh, uh, you know, for like 25 years, um, I think it's pretty much divided. I mean, some of the guides, uh, he, you know, here's the basic gist of it. Sickles' forward movement disrupted the plans of the Southern Army that day. Mm. And then, of course, you know, and I think uh, Jim said it best when the whole battle just becomes just a slugfest after that. And uh, so any, I think a lot of people, anything that led to the ultimate Northern victory, um, you know, was a good thing. I think some of the guys look at Sickles' forward movement as an inadvertent defense in depth. Because Sickles move forward, then the other units are have to come up behind and, uh, you know, occupy a little round top and uh, the weed field and uh, the area, the right. value of death. Was, that and was it, the result, but that's not the intention. Yeah, and then right? some people would argue, some guides, and I'm just speaking of all the guides right, in general. Right, right, right. Because I hear them in the guide room all the time talking about it. Some of the guides tend to believe that, um, uh, you know, Sickles acted as sort of a speed bump and, and you know, the, slow down the Confederate attack and absorb some of the shock of the Confederate attack. And, of course, you know, it was very costly for the men in the Third Army Corps. But eventually this all led to the Union Army holding Little Round Top and Cemetery Ridge. And that's all good argument. One, of course, one of the basic things um, that, you know, Jim points out in his Sickles book is that when Sickles leaves Little Round Top, you know, fortunately for him, other troops come to Little Round Top and occupy it because he made no attempt to, you know, to hold Little Round Top. I mean— if the Northern Army hadn't gotten a little round top before the Southern attack and the Southern Army swept up and over a little round top behind Sickles' line, we might have different ideas about uh, Sickles' forward movement. But I, I, I don't know about you, Jim, but I find that I, I guess I would say it's something like 70 30 with the pro sickle or the anti sickles guides being about 70, pro sickles guides being about 30. But you, you're, uh, you hit it right on uh, um, the, uh, the, head. Uh, the question that it's not like there's middle ground. Right. There's like seventy percent right. feel this way. Right. Thirty. It's really fascinating yeah. dynamic in the guide room. You, you know, and that's a great point, and not just even dynamic in the guide room, but I think just dynamic among historians in general. I swear to God, when so when my Sickles book came out two thousand nine, so now we're talking eleven years ago, the number of people that came up to me and said, "I did not think it was possible to do an unbiased Sickles book because everybody, like Tim said, is you know, One I'm not going to mention the name, but I rem I distinctly remember getting." 
getting accosted by a colleague of ours in the middle of a tour on Little Round Top who heard this heard this Sickles book was coming out and was positive I was going to be doing a hatchet job on General Meade. That man is still guiding, by the way. But um, <laughs> it, it's, so as, you, as Tim talked about, there's no middle ground. It's, it's you know, you, yeah. you either love him or hate him. And Why do you think that is? Why is he so... I think it's more post battle, you know, okay. because some of the some of the comparisons I always make is you know compare him to Francis Barlow, who yeah. does a very does similar move thing. on Great yeah. July first, um, you know, very similar move on July first. Ultimately, doesn't go the way Barlow wanted, I'm sure. But we don't mm-hmm. we don't sleep in our I hate Barlow underwear the way people do, you know, about Sickles. And and I really think it's the post battle stuff, the way he goes after Meade, the way he you know lies about some of his positions. Like yes, I occupied Little Round Top. I think the dastardly stuff that he does afterwards is the real reason I think people hate Sickles. Or, or have, before the war, maybe the dastardly yeah. stuff before. Yeah, well, right. He was just well. What's the book about him? American scoundrel. Is, I mean, Sickles of Gettysburg, you mean, right, Matt? I you mean, mean the, that book, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. right? I Are there the, any other books? I meant the inferior <laughs> no, no book books. about yes, Sickles. Yes, yes. It's called. The Man Who Got Away with Murder. Isn't that another one? <laughs> the Congressman Who Got Away with Murder, which, okay. which specifically talks about the, the murder trial. I have I Hate Francis Barlow uh, bed sheets that I sleep in. So, you know, I, <laughs> What? I was going to say, I actually do hate Francis Barlow. Do you? I, I don't like anybody named Channing. Channing, yeah. <laughs> Carol, yeah. Channing Tatum, or Francis Channing Barlow. I don't like any of them. Uh, he had a second part of that question. He says, are there any individual stories or less known stories from the peach orchard? Sickles always dominates the narrative, and I was hoping the guides would give us insight into some lesser known people or stories they have to tell. How about any, you got stories of valor or f- funny stories or anything that comes out of this hell? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's that, and that's a great question because again, just quick personal anecdote. You know, I give my sickles tour, I give my peach orchard tour. They can they overlap, but they're kind of different tours. And you come out and you do my peach orchard tour, and I'll start out by saying this is not my sickles tour. And sure enough, the first hand that goes up will say, "Well, where was he supposed to be, and why did he move forward?" <laughs> so, so, so as Morgan astutely said, sickles is just always going to dominate the narrative. Yeah. But having said that, so when Britt and I did this Gettysburg's Peach Orchard book, one of the things we really, really tried to do was make sure Sickles did not dominate the narrative and that we got some of the other stories across. And, you know, there's the sure fees, uh, you know, there's Medal of Honor recipients and all that stuff. If, you, if, if you're going to have me pick a story, I always like doing the story of um, uh, Captain Alonson Nelson of the 57th Pennsylvania. And the 57th Pennsylvania is one of the units literally defending around the Sherfy house. So as Barksdale's attack is coming in, there's about 15 men or so from the 57th who are literally inside the Sherfy house. And they're outside the windows. They're shooting at Barksdale's guys. The commander of the 57th finally says, okay, this is getting too hot. We're getting out of here. And Captain Nelson says, we got guys in the house. We got to get them out. And what do you think the colonel says? The colonel says, okay, you get them out. We're, we're, we're pulling out of here. So Captain Alonson Nelson, risking his own life and limb, goes into the house and literally is trying to pull guys out of there. And he says it's so loud. He's shouting in their ears, you know, get out of here. We got to get out. He gets a couple of guys out. Finally, he looks out a window. He sees the house is about to be overrun by Barksdale's men, so he bursts out the front door, does the 100-yard dash over a fence in a single bound. You know, they're saying, surrender, you damn Yankee, and he just leaps over the fence and makes it to Cemetery Ridge. Uh, and I just I always like that story. I think it's got That's, heroism. Yeah. That would make it's got a everything. good scene in a movie. I guess I guess somebody alluded to it earlier about the Wentz farm, or you alluded to it, so we should probably tell that story. But, okay. Uh, uh, there was a, a right at the intersection, there's a little piece of ground, and there's a, a farmhouse, and it's owned by uh, John Wentz. And um, his son, Henry Wentz, uh, had, much like Wesley Culp, had moved to Virginia prior to the war, and he joined a Virginian artillery unit. And that artillery unit, which I believe is an Alexander's Battalion, um, is it a... Um, uh, I don't even remember. Is it Miller's uh, Battalion? Miller's, I think. So uh, they're actually positioned on July 2nd, across on Seminary Ridge, and he ends up firing rounds at the Peach Orchard into his 
you know, parents' property is it, actually, I, I guess he's from the first marriage of John Wentz. But then after they captured the peach orchard, you know, his artillery unit is set up near his father's house and he goes into the house and there's his father. They have a conversation. And uh, much, uh, many people make uh, uh, much of the story that uh, on uh, the evening, July 3rd, the Southern Army pulls back to Seminary Ridge. And uh, he goes in the house again to say goodbye to his father and his father sleeping. So he writes a note and, t- um, you know, puts the note on to his lapel. But he actually, the day before, actually spoke to his father. So, hmm. And Henry Wentz actually owns a piece of land on the other side of the Peach Church, on the other side of the Emmitsburg Road. So he actually, his battery actually crossed a piece of land that he owned and is on the tax records with. Wait, current, at the like time owned of the battle. in 1863 yeah. or yeah. prior to no, leaving? No, he owned it. Well, he bought it before the battle, but he owned it. Now, there was no house on it. It's just some farmland over here. Yeah. But he actually owns property that the Confederate Army crossed in the huh. attack. Somebody asked me one time, do we know who owns that stretch today? Is that a stretch that's in the park, Holdings, or is that kind yeah, of Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think Sal, there is a stretch down there's a piece down here that the park didn't own i don't know if they it's still but they didn't own it's on the uh east side of the road just south of the peach orchard there was a privately owned stretch of land but i think on the other side they do own that did he grow up here or he would have grown up he grew up in that house um, that wasn't just yeah, like a place that his I, father I moved to. I don't remember when or... the Wences got the house. Right, exactly. And I forget the age. We've got it in the book. He was originally, I think, born in York County. Yeah, right? that's right. That's and right. Moved here. Yeah, he's born, um, I think, out near like the West Manchester Mall. I remember I remember we had some Wentz researchers come and do research on the family. And he, The family is from York County and moved here at some point. But huh. um, Henry Wentz's um, uncle, I think, is... Um, uh, the banners, uh, the beamers, and uh, they have a son in Company K, and they live about a mile, uh, yeah, about a mile south and just a little east of us. Because there, the, how many? Uh, there were what, like five or so former Gettysburg residents in the Confederate I guess Army. It depends how you count. Well, one, two, three, four, five. How do okay. you count? <laughs> it depends on, you know, are we counting Jim Furley, the guide with uh, Early's Ralph division Furley. that comes through on June 26th? You know, are we counting a kid from uh, Emmitsburg that spent time in Gettysburg that's no, in Stewart's we don't count no, no. We'll just say off the top, no Emmitsburg. <laughs> oh, yeah. But he yeah. lived in Gettysburg yeah. and worked here for a time. You know, so I, I, I think it depends upon the account. But um, in, uh, in, um, uh, you know, I think that I know a lot about the local people and who what units who served in and of course um there's the carriage maker hoffman and right. two of his sons served in the confederate army and i did not know until jim and wayne's book on pickett's charge came out that one of the hoffmans is in an artillery battery yeah. on Stray july lines. 3rd Stray right lines. at the Sherfy house oh really yeah we um the hoff thank thanks to him, the hoffman brothers and you know credit credit where credit is due that was a research discovery at wayne's um but we put it in the pickett's charge book now a dear friend of ours tom mcmillan um his sense elaborated on that in the Gettysburg Rebels book. That might be the five that, that, that you're might be of. what I'm thinking of. Yeah, but as far as we know, that Hoffman in Stribling's artillery battery was told for the first time in our Pickett's Charge book. Wow! And so you know those, you put three other three Hoffmans, Wentz, and Culp, and that at least gives you the five Confederates. Uh, okay, last question, John Hudak. On, uh, from Facebook asks if we can elaborate on the involvement of Maine and New Hampshire regiments in the fighting around the Peach Orchard and the Sherfy Farm. Yeah, um, the Second New Hampshire specifically is is definitely one we give a lot of a lot of play to. Um, their colonel was uh, Colonel Edward Bailey, and. I think, in my view, the 2nd New Hampshire is unique because, you know, the Union Infantry initially kind of starts the day supporting the batteries up near the Wheatfield Road. Mm -hmm. And then when Kershaw attacks, a lot of these units basically rush from the Wheatfield Road to the south end of today's Peach Orchard. And Bailey and the 2nd New Hampshire lead that charge. Um, So they're in action all over the Peach Orchard. Uh, Again, part of they kind of make a stand near the Wentz property during kind of this last stand 
before before they're overrun. So yeah, the second New Hampshire's got a uh, got a great story out here. Uh, likewise with the third main, you know, the third main has a really long day. Uh, they start off with the you know the firefight over in Pitzer's Woods uh, mm-hmm. in the um, um, uh, the late late morning early afternoon, and then by you know later in the day they're fighting here at the uh, the Peach Orchard too. And I think what's interesting too when you think about those guys is they're all from different brigades. So you think about when you look at the Peach Orchard defense and these units, you think about all these units from different brigades and all the command and control issues that the uh, northern commanders are going to have in defending the ground. <laughs> yeah, I think the third and the fourth main uh, of, uh, um, you know, um, Hobart, John Henry Hobart Ward's brigade, uh, and of course the Bredan Sharpshooters in that brigade, were on the skirmish line early in the morning on July 2nd, even before the third main got sent into that uh so they're on the skirmish line, and they're sent into that action, and then they end up in the peach orchard. So, um, oh, you know, I just remembered. I'm sorry. I'll have to. It was Joseph Warren Danner is the guy's name that was from, uh, had worked in Gettysburg in the Confederate Army. Oh, gotcha. And uh, I think he was a cousin of the Danners that lived in the square. And uh, his brother was Clinton DeWitt Danner. So two brothers. But uh, DeWitt was in the Union. He was, he was in the Union Army, and his brother's in the Southern Army. Okay. Well, Jim, thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Very, been a long time coming. It has been a long time coming. I'm very grateful for you to do this uh, for us. So that would be cool, uh, or that was cool of you to do. Uh, one more time here, Gettysburg's Peach Orchard, Longstreet Sickles, and the bloody fight for the commanding ground. Oh, well, should we, should we uh, I'm in the middle mention? of reading his book there, well, you, Tim. And no, I, I just wanted to mention, uh, <laughs> well, I guess while, he's you're, have while to you're read in again. the middle of reading his book title, <laughs> yeah. that... Uh, Jim's book just won the Batchelder Connington Award from the Robert E. Lee Civil War Roundtable well, of Central New Jersey. I might mention that the Devil's Den book yes. is a previous winner wow. of that same award. You know, that's a great point. Now, I've won it twice because the Sickles book won it, too. But think about it. You have dual Batchelder Coddington Award winners here wow. today. Wow. Right. I got I to gotta, yeah. gotta splice that into the beginning now. Well, that's what these <laughs> these high leather back chairs that we're sitting in and our smoking jackets, right? <laughs> yeah. So. And the portable bookshelf you brought yes, to sit exactly. in front of. <laughs> um, wow. Oh, that's pretty great. Well, that's the net. from now on, Tim, I have to introduce you as award-winning Tim Smith. Um, all right, let me try the books again. Gettysburg's Peach Orchard, Longstreet Sickles, and the Bloody Fight for the Commanding Ground along the Emmitsburg Road, co-authored with Britt Eisenberg. Um, we also have Sickles at Gettysburg, solo authored, and Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg with Wayne Motts as the co-author. All of those, I'll put links to all of those in the description here. They're all available uh, on the recommended reading page on Addressing Gettysburg. Tim, thank you. Eric, thank you. Jim Hessler, thank you very much. Thank Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, Battle of Gettysburg podcast. Thank you very also much, listen man. to that. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. All right. You made it, and there's still light. Yeah. Beautiful. Good job. All right. Well, it was right. really pleasant out once the sun went down. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the only thing I was... Uh, the only thing I think...